I've done several videos on materialism. This one is going to focus on materialism and mathematics because maths is often seen as something that is essentially ideal rather than something material. And I want to show that when we study the origins and practice of mathematics, this is not the case at all. So, the, there is a, a famous article by Wigner, or Wigner or Wigner, the, about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And he's asking how the maths, which is a product of pure thought, can be so unreasonably effective in handling the physical world. Why should something which derives from thought actually end up working in the physical world? And he gives an example of two high school, former high school students. Mm. These students meet and one looks over at the other and sees a whole bunch of notes he's got. And he says, what, what do you do now? And the other one says, well, I'm a statistician. And he says, what's that formula there for? And he says, well, that's the formula of the normal distribution. What do you use that for? Well, we use it to predict things about the population. What's, th what's that symbol there? Well, that symbol there is, is pi, the, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle. Now, why is it that something as arcane as the radius of the circumference and diameter of a circle, ratio of the circumference and diameter of a circle, has any relevance? You can't persuade me that that can be right. Now, but it does turn out to be right. Why should something like that be useful? And more generally, why does maths work? Uh, now, when we look at it in these terms, if we look at it in terms of formulae uh, and things like pi, which are well into maths, it's a mystery or can appear mysterious. But when you ask what's useful about maths, it's always applied maths. It's real calculations that people do based on formulae. It's not the formulae themselves. They're, it's only useful when the formulae are used to churn out actual numbers. And when they're churning out actual numbers, you're now talking about computation. And you can think of the formulae as software. But behind this, there's always some physical hardware. It's not abstract pure thought that does the calculations. People don't calculate by thought, they calculate by tools. And it's worth looking at the earliest computing hardware. There's a, a bone known as the Ashango bone, um, which is 20,000 years old, or maybe 22,000 years old, depending on your assessment of how good the carbon dating is. And it's probably a baboon bone. And it's got incised grooves on it which are clearly there for counting. Then in groups, some, some, some are grouped in four groups and larger groups. So people have been doing count, counting using a bone like this. But this is just an early example of something which we have lots of more recent examples of, of people using tally, tallying devices of one sort or another. Uh, tally sticks can obviously be used instead of bones. And probably sticks were used well before bones, except the sticks have rotted away and we happen to have that bone. And these are some examples of sticks which were tally sticks from the Middle Ages, and or, or repli replicators of them in some cases. And you'll see some of these have got straight notches on them. The others got notches in V and X forms. And it's thought that the Roman numerals arose from 
marks that people used to carve on tally sticks to denote 4, 5, 10, etc. And these markings then were removed from the sticks and became an independent way of writing numbers down. Now, when one's dealing with something as simple as counting with notches in a stick, you can see what's behind this. You've got two physical systems. For example, a goat herd with a bunch of goats. And you've got a stick or a bone in which he notches a notch in it each time he lets a goat out of its pen. So as he sets off, he's got as many notches on his stick as there are goats going with him. When he comes back, as he lets them into the pen, he runs his finger along the stick, going in one notch at a time as he lets the um, one goat in at a time, as you move your thumbnail along it. Now, if they don't match up, he knows that uh, either he's got somebody else's goats or a goat is missing and he's got to go out and look for it. Now, why did tally sticks work? It, all it depends on is it depends on the notches being more durable than your goats. It's going to be reliable so long as the notches don't wear out and if your goat is missing you'll still have the notch there. So the, there are two physical systems, the notches and the goats, and one is being used to model the other. Now we can call it numbers but what it actually is, is two physical systems that have a relationship between them. And the relationship is preserved over time just by the durability of the materials. And all maths comes down to this. It comes down to a matter of making small physical systems or physical tools that model other parts of the world. And that's a very simple example the goats and the um, notches. It's all, but all maths is dependent on physical tools. These physical tools change over time. For instance, the Incas used not knotted string to, to denote numbers and, and count and pass information around. Uh, the both the Europeans and the Chinese use abacuses to, to do their calculations. And these abacuses, again, are physical objects that are being moved around, the beads. And the numbers represent positions of the beads. And you're keeping track of physical items being loaded onto a ship, for example, by moving beads along. And you know at the end, you can count them off and see whether the same number are there. So all that you've required to go beyond this is a way of noting things down on a clay tablet or on a piece of uh, parchment or on a piece of papyrus to write down the things that you saw on the abacus. In fact, if uh, there are Roman abacuses which look very like... Um, pocket calculators and they're they're marked off with the Roman numerals uh, so you can people think how did you do sums with Roman numerals well you didn't do them with pencil and paper you did them with an abacus marked off in I, V, X etc rows and of course another big branch of maths was geometry and geometry is obviously done with tools straight edge and ruler the whole of Euclidean geometry is a set of rules by which you can um, do things with a straight edge and ruler and prove what you've got. Now, um, more recently, when I say recently, I'm saying say, say from the 14 or 1500s in Europe, we dropped the 
Roman system of numbers or the European system of numbers and adopted the Indian or place notation system numbers. But still children are taught in school or were taught in school with physical objects, a slate and a chalk, or nowadays pencil and paper. You actually have physical tools to do the sums. There is a, a feedback relationship that uh, the human maths po process goes in terms of you observe something that's been written down or something that's on the abacus. You remember a rule, let's say a rule for adding uh, in the case of an abacus or a rule for adding in the case of the slate. And you then act and the action is either move beads in an abacus or write something down on a slate if you're using the more modern Indian number system. And it's not just applied to, to simple maths. If you think of someone doing an algebraic proof on a, a blackboard, the same thing is happening. The observed part of the formula, they apply a rule that they've remembered, they write or rub out some symbols, and then they go continue repeat the process. At all stages it's an interaction between a person and their tools and in this sense is no different from using any other set of tools. So for human computers the rules of maths are the software that we apply. The blackboard is the store equivalent to the store of our computer and the human acts as a sequencer. And the combinations of one, two and three, the store, the rules and the person who physically carries out the actions are a functioning computer. And until electronic computers were invented, that's what the term computer meant. It meant a person working with a, a slate, a abacus or a pieces of squared paper to do computations. It was then realized by Turing that if you could build a machine that could detect a small number of symbols at a time, if it had a finite internal memory or state, if it had a set of rules in read-only memory and had the ability to read or write to memory to record uh, calculations, then you'd have a machine that could do everything that a mathematician would do. And that was the, the famous Turing machine. Um, it was a hypothetical machine when he described it, but people have built prototypes of it where it had, it had a tape which moved left or right. Um, you could have a right, read-write head that could write a one or a zero on the tape. It had a, a a sensor of some sort which could tell what was on that and it could move the tape to the left or the right and it could rub out the current symbol and it had a finite set of rules in a table which then acted as a program. And Turing was able to show that if you start out with this simple set of operations you have a universal computing device that can perform any computation. And He's saying it can perform any computation that anything can do, including a mathematician. And he's saying that mathematicians do exactly the same set of things. Because the set of things they do is quite simple, it is in principle possible to mechanise all mathematics. But people may say, oh, well, you're talking all about mechanisms, you're talking all about matter. What about logic? What about logical deduction from axioms? Wasn't the great thing about Euclid that he was able to prove geometry from a set of axioms? Now, over time, we've learned procedures that work. We've learned mathematical procedures that give the results we want. And this process of learning is no different from any technical learning associated with any other art, whether it's the art of blacksmithing or the art of woodwork 
All of these have procedures which we've learned work. The axioms that Euclid chose were ones that worked in order to prove what he wanted to prove. He wanted to at least to be able to prove the theorem of Pythagoras, for example. And he had a set of axioms which enable him to prove that. That doesn't follow that the axioms came first. No. People knew the theorem of Pythagoras empirically as geometers from measuring the earth and measuring uh, physical objects. And what Euclid did was provide a set of axioms by which you could deduce that, but it's not the case that knowledge of Pythagoras' theorem came from the axioms. You knew Pythagoras' theorem first, and you select the axioms such that they would prove it. If he had a set of axioms which failed to prove Pythagoras' uh, theorem, he would have adjusted the axioms that he had the right ones. We, we don't know which axioms he had before he published it. And more generally, if you have different axioms, you get different theorems. And when you want to study curved space-time, you have a different set of axioms. And the, these are just abstract software. We don't think there's anything remarkable about the fact that a given piece of software works. By trial and error and by following rules we've learned, we're able to construct a piece of software that works. And what mathematicians did with their uh, systems of deduction are, are in fact not significantly different from that. And the proof of the effectiveness of the mathematics comes when it's actually applied to do real computations, and these real computations correspond to something that exists in the real world. And the real computations are always done with physical devices. So the effectiveness of mathematics is always an effectiveness of a computational procedure for modelling some part of the world. And in many cases, these are very simple models keeping count of the number of uh, sheep leaving a pen, uh, adding together coins in your pocket, or following a set of rules with symbols which will give you the same answer as when you add the coins, two piles of coins together, and then count them up separately. You have a set of rules we've developed which when you manipulate the, the, the digits and follow rules of addition you learned in primary school, you can get the same answer. It's because practically we've learned the techniques which work and rejected the techniques which didn't work. So fundamentally there's nothing more marvellous there than there is in any other technique by which we manipulate the world except that what's different here is that we're modelling the world and predicting the world. But it's still a set of techniques, and it still has a technology, and it's not something ideal.